Greetings and salutations, everyone. Thersites the Historian here, and today we're taking a look at the presidential prospects and life of one Beto O'Rourke, a Texas Democrat who is seeking the Democratic nomination for 2020. While Kyle Kalinske of Secular Talk has given Beto the nickname of Bet on My Stork, and that's a pretty good nickname, I propose instead that we call him Tube Man. The reason I would like to call him Tube Man is because he likes to throw his hands around and he is kind of empty and hollow when it comes to policy substance. However, in this video, I will argue that he is not without other merits and that he would have been a much more interesting and fulfilled person if he had just not gone into politics in the first place. So let's look at Beto's life and then his political performance and then his political prospects. Robert Francis O'Rourke was born in El Paso, Texas on September 26, 1972. He had the nickname Beto from a very early age to distinguish him from his grandfather who had the same name. In fact, as early as his elementary school yearbooks, Beto went by the name Beto. He is a fourth generation Irishman, however, so many of his opponents and detractors have said that he called himself Beto for political gain. I don't think that's actually true because his family grew up around so many Hispanic families in El Paso that they were well aware of the custom of calling people whose names ended in Berto, Beto. And they simply adopted that to give him a nickname that would make him distinctive within their own family. So I think it actually was a genuine adoption of the custom of a neighbor and not cultural appropriation or whatever you might want to call it. Beto's mother is the stepdaughter of JFK's Secretary of the Navy, so he does have some political pedigree on his mother's side. However, the primary influence in Beto's life was without a doubt his father, Pat. Pat was county commissioner, county judge, a friend of Governor White, and held events for Jesse Jackson's presidential runs in 1984 and 1988. Beto went on to attend Columbia University where he earned a BA in English and he is also a fluent Spanish speaker. The best known Beto O'Rourke quote, which kind of encapsulates his combination of energy and also vapidness, is, I want to be in it. Man, I'm just born to be in it. This is an exact quote of what he said to Vanity Fair when he was announcing his intention to run for president. The question that I would like to pose in this video as a whole is, was Beto actually born to be in it? I think that his answer would be yes, definitely, but my answer is that he doesn't quite understand himself and that his efforts to find himself were not successful. This will require some time to spell out, but I think that you'll see where I'm coming from in the course of time. Beto grew up in a political household. His father, Pat O'Rourke, was, as I mentioned earlier, a politician in El Paso. While Pat was a Democrat in the 1980s, he held office after office, he had friends in high places, and he was a big player in El Paso. Then he became a Republican in the 90s as the state began to turn to the right. And for whatever reason, he was not able to replicate the success that he had had in the 1980s. Pat ran for various offices in the 90s, but wasn't able to win. I assume it's because he was running as a Republican in a deep blue city. I imagine that has something to do with it. Anyway, Pat kept running, and in 2001, he eventually died in a bicycle accident. But um, anyway, Beto would have taken away the idea that his family was a political one and that the family profession was politics. Beto grew up interested in politics and he attended political events. While he had no intention of going into politics himself, he certainly was interested. Beto says that he was shy in his youth and his father had to urge him to say hello to people at political gatherings. He was not a natural politician and I don't think he is now either. A lot of the sort of crazy hand gestures that he does, I think, can be attributed to nervous energy that he might not feel if he were more comfortable dealing with people. In the summer of 1991, between high school and college, Beto was a summer intern in the U.S. House. He was then active in local and state elections in the early 2000s. 
I get the impression that his father's sudden death in 2001 inspired Beto to become more political, and that it was at that time in his life where he decided that the one thing that he might be good at was the thing that his father had done, politics. Not only was young Beto O'Rourke somewhat bashful, but he also felt like he was an outcast. And because of that, he decided to turn to alternative culture to try to find his place in the world. As a teenager, Beto belonged to a hacking group called Cult of the Dead. While still in that group, under the name Psychedelic Warlord, Beto wrote about so-called scene sluts, i.e. women who hang out with bands. And in another piece, he wrote about a guy who decided to run over kids for kicks. Now, these pieces were just the ramblings of a teenager who wasn't getting laid, but the Republicans have tried to make this into evidence that Beto is temperamentally unsound. That's ridiculous. Um, it, this is nothing. If anything, it makes Beto a bit more relatable, and it makes him seem like he has something of an edge, which is something that he needs, given that he comes off as a bit bland these days. Many of his detractors often call him Beta. Um, so at least having some edge in some way is uh, a good thing. Anyway, when he went to college, he seems to have really taken his recreation seriously. He co-captained Columbia's heavyweight rowing team, and then he got deep into the punk scene. He actually played for four different bands while he was at Columbia. The main two were Foss, where he played bass. This was a band composed of kids from El Paso. And the other band that he played with was the Swedes. He played drums for them. He was also a member of two bands that I assume didn't really last very long called Fragile Gang and the Sheeps. I'm really surprised that the Republicans haven't tried to play on the fact that he was a member of Fragile Gang since they really like to attack him for being a beta. I mean, I feel like this is leaving a freebie on the table, but what do I know? Anyway, um, one of both Foss and the Swedes were able to put out albums in 1993 and 1995, respectively. The Foss album was actually self-published, and the album cover is pictured on the left. As you see, Beto wore a dress for the album cover, and of course, the Republicans have talked all about that. But in reality, this is just something that bands do, and no one really cares. When people see this, they're more likely to think, oh, cool, he was in a punk band, than, oh, he's wearing a dress. That is very bad. After his graduation in 1995, and until about 2005, Beto was almost driftless. He didn't really have a clear direction in life. And right after graduation, he worked as a live-in caretaker and as an art mover. Later on, Beto put his computer skills to work for his uncle's internet service provider. That's back when you actually had local ISPs and Spectrum didn't control the entire country. After that, Beto was hired by H.W. Wilson Company to proofread, finally putting his English degree to work, and he also wrote short stories in his spare time. So at this stage in his life, he still has some life in him. He's still trying to be creative and do things. But at the same time, he's trying to find a more stable career now that he's well into his 20s and, you know, trying to settle down a bit. In 1998, this is, I think, possibly related to his DWI that we'll get to. He returned to El Paso and began working in his mother's furniture store while living in an apartment building that was owned by his father. The apartment, I assume, was subsidized, and his job at his mother's furniture store was simply keeping track of her inventory on the upstairs computer. So it was a fairly cush job and a subsidized apartment. He was effectively living at home. In 2005, he married Amy Hoover Sanders, an old family friend and a wealthy woman, the most important career decision that he ever made the thing that enabled him to become Tube Man. Now, it's a, there's an interesting story when it comes to Amy's parents and Beto's parents. One of, one of each of their parents dated the other, and then I think that that person then introduced Beto's mother and father. So the two families go way back, and both uh, of them were prominent families in their respective areas. I believe that Amy's family has ties in both El Paso and in New Mexico. 
Anyway, later on, I guess, Amy and Beto reconnected, fell in love, and got married. And for Beto, this was important because it made him a man of leisure and then allowed him to become Tube Man. Quick programming note. I don't really have any information on what Beto was doing professionally between 1998 and 2005. I know that he worked on a couple of Democratic campaigns, but I don't really know what he was doing for a living. So it's possible that he really got his life together during that period. I don't know. So just a disclaimer, in case you were thinking that he was just kind of a drifter for 10 years, it's possible that he was, but I don't know that for certain. Anyway, to return to the story. That period between 1995 and 1998 was not a particularly good one for Beto, and this seems to have really been more or less the low point of his life. In 1995, Beto and his friends were arrested at the University of Texas El Paso. They were charged with burglary after jumping over a fence, and then they were held overnight. However, the charges were dropped. Most likely, they just got drunk at a football game, and that happened. Um, it's possible the charges were dropped because of Beto's father giving someone at the school a phone call, but it's also just possible that they were young guys who were arrested at a football game for drinking and that the campus police didn't take it too seriously. The one thing that Beto did that really got him into trouble and the probably biggest scandal of his life was on September 27, 1998, when he was issued with a DWI. After attending court-recommended DWI program, the DWI charges were dropped in October 1999. However, the mugshot has survived, and it has been used mercilessly as a meme by the Republicans. The best of the memes that they were able to produce was one that they released on Twitter on St. Patrick's Day, putting a little leprechaun hat on him and then saying, please drink responsibly. I think that he might have said something to the effect of this was trying to demean his Irish heritage, but I think that he was just being a little sensitive. This one is actually kind of funny. To Beto's credit, he's actually been pretty open about his experience getting a DWI. He says that he's grateful that he got the chance to um, work through the DWI program. But despite being more or less open about it, this is something that he's continued to get bludgeoned with over and over and over. Um, I remember back when George W. Bush was president, Republicans were outraged that people brought up his past with, as an alcoholic, but yet uh, Beto's past with one DWI is fair game. I mean, you know, fun bipartisan double standards, I guess. Just to recap a bit, Beto O'Rourke really became active in local Democratic politics in the early 2000s, and then he married Amy Sanders in 2005. Amy's father is worth about $140 million, give or take, and so Beto has been a man of leisure ever since. In 2005, he decided to use his newfound leisure to run for the El Paso City Council. That year, he ran on a platform of downtown development and border reform. Once he was elected, he was unanimously chosen to be president pro temp during his first term. This is apparently something that means a lot to Beto that he got this minor honor from his colleagues immediately upon his arrival in the chamber. This seems to be the kind of validation that he'd been looking for, and it really seems to have spurred him on to go further in politics. Of course, a president pro temp doesn't really do anything of note, but it does mean that his colleagues must trust him in some way. Beto's father-in-law was in charge of a redevelopment plan in one of the Hispanic neighborhoods of El Paso, and this became controversial because most of the residents understood that they might be priced out of their own neighborhood due to gentrification. This started a whole big mess and the person who took the brunt of the abuse was Beto, since it was his father-in-law who would be the person pocketing money from this project. Only Beto faced a recall campaign from activists, and this recall campaign was pretty fierce. It nearly took him out of city council, but ultimately, by going door-to-door -door and trying to explain himself and campaign for the development, he was able to hold on to his seat. The development plan apparently collapsed because the recession hit right when all this was going on, or at least the fiscal impact of the recession finally hit 
while this was being implemented. So this housing project didn't end up really happening, but it still almost ended Beto's local politics career. Just three years after nearly being recalled from city council, Beto debuted on the national stage when he challenged eight-term incumbent Democrat Sylvester Reyes in the primaries. It's worth considering just how much of a disadvantage Beto was at. Reyes was an incumbent, so he had name recognition. He was Hispanic in a community that was a majority Hispanic, and Reyes could raise quite a bit of money. So in order to contrast with Reyes, Beto did something that was low-key ballsy. People of color are traditionally somewhat more socially conservative than white people, at least on the Democratic side. And so what O'Rourke did was to draw a contrast by going left on social issues. He campaigned as openly pro-LGBTQ. Now that wasn't terribly risky in 2012, but it was still somewhat of an odd way to make himself different from his opponent. And another thing that he ran on that he had been talking about for years at this point was liberalizing drug policies, mostly decriminalizing marijuana. Beto's campaign relied heavily on canvassing since he didn't have much money, and Beto personally supposedly knocked on 16,000 doors in El Paso. Beto was able to barely squeak out a win and only avoided a runoff by a margin of a few hundred votes. Had it gone to a runoff, Reyes's name recognition most likely would have enabled him to win. Also, then he would have been alerted to the danger that Beto posed. It appears that Beto did something somewhat comparable to what Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez was able to pull off in New York. Although, of course, Reyes is, was much less prominent on a national stage than Joe Crowley. And also, Beto hasn't really done anything in the House anywhere near comparable to what AOC has been trying to do. Speaking of Beto's time in the House, he served three terms. Each time he ran, he won easily in the general election because he's in a deep blue district. The first major decision that he had to make was whether or not he would join the House Hispanic Congressional Caucus. Now, because his district was so heavily Hispanic, it was sort of a given that the representative would be Hispanic and would be a member of the caucus. Beto got something of a special waiver from the members of the caucus who said that he could join since he represented the community. However, he declined since the organization's bylaws had previously stated that members needed to be of Hispanic origin. So I think that's something that if it were to come out, it would be in his favor simply because um, it's very common for Democrats to attack each other over things like cultural appropriation. So Beto can't really be accused of it on that level since he was given a pretty easy opportunity to um, pose as Hispanic and said no. Once in office, one of the first things that he did was to create bipartisan legislation for an ombudsman within the Homeland Security Department to investigate human rights abuses. That was a fairly substantial step forward. He also opposed Obama's deferred action policy to spare 5 million undocumented workers from deportation due to Beto's personal discomfort with executive action. So for the most part, Beto has usually been pro-immigration, but he has also done some things that were clearly about securing the border. So his stances on that are a bit complex but apparently they were relatively popular within his community since he remained a fairly uh, popular candidate and had no trouble getting reelected. At any rate, though, it's I'm, I would be curious to know if Beto has a fully formulated um, idea of executive power or whether he was just opposed to um, preventing 5 million people from uh, being allowed to stay. I don't really know exactly where he was coming from. My suspicion is that it was about this policy in particular and not about his theory of executive action since Beto is not really a deep thinker on that kind of philosophical level. One thing that Beto did do that he could really build on if he wanted to try to make himself distinctive, um, he voted against funding Israel's Iron Dome and he was one of the few people to not attend when the Israeli Prime Minister addressed Congress. 
if he were to play this up in some way, it's possible that he could become one of the few candidates who takes a strong stand against Israel. Now, while that is somewhat risky since everyone is expected to just be a huge fan of Israel, I think that there is a clamoring for someone to stand up to Israel, especially on the left. So if Beto could reclaim his punk rock roots, maybe he could actually stand out for a reason that has to do with policy rather than for having the most arm movement when he talks. As we'll see, one of the real issues when it comes to Beto's campaign is that it's hard to pin down where he lies on the ideological spectrum. This was also an issue when he ran against Ted Cruz in 2018. So what I'd like to do is try to figure out who his political allies are. That can sometimes give you a pretty good idea of where someone's ideological affiliation lies. O'Rourke in 2016 did endorse Hillary, but he only did so at a late date. That indicates that it's possible that he might be somewhat progressive-ish, or else maybe he was hoping for a more conservative candidate. It's not really clear. When Tim Ryan challenged Nancy Pelosi after the disastrous 2016 election, O'Rourke supported his bid, citing the need to change leaders and his support for term limits. So that doesn't really commit him ideologically necessarily, but it does give you a hint of where he might lie. He co-sponsored a piece of legislation with Eric Swalwell, the American Families United Act, promoting the idea that citizens can sponsor their spouses for citizenship, which I had always assumed was a law, but apparently this is something that is still being worked out. Anyway, in 2018, O'Rourke gave up his House seat to run for the Senate. So if we just look at who he was friends with while he was in the House, I think that it's actually pretty accurate to say that he is relatively close on the spectrum to both Eric Swalwell and Tim Ryan. The only picture I could find with both of them also included Seth Moulton, but I think that all three of Beto, Tim Ryan, and Eric Swalwell are enough to the left of Moulton that it is worth separating them if you had to put them on a chart. I think Ryan is slightly to the left of O'Rourke and then O'Rourke is slightly to the left of Swalwell, but it would have to be really close at any rate. The only reason I'd put Ryan a little bit to the left of them is because he is strong on the issue of trade and I think that economic issues are more important for determining one's place on the left-right spectrum than social issues. On social issues, they kind of all agree, but Ryan might actually be a little bit more conservative than the others. But again, economic issues trump. Despite being a right-wing Christian conservative in Texas, Ted Cruz was in trouble going into the 2018 midterms. Back in 2014, he had really alienated Senate Republican leadership by shutting down the government even after McConnell had reached a deal with the Senate Democrats and President Obama. In 2016, Cruz's smarm and general lack of charm did not endear him to any of his fellow candidates and also made him something of a pariah with a lot of the Trump voters in the party who saw him as backhanded, conniving, and sneaky. Of course, he did the famous vote your conscience thing at the RNC, which was a clear indication that he thought that maybe they should consider not voting for Trump. Um, it was pretty bad, and a lot of Republicans were still pretty raw about it going into the midterms. So not only did people think that Trump wouldn't come to Cruz's aid, they also thought that a whole lot of the party would just leave him out to dry. It also happens that 2018 was a year of backlash against the Republicans in the Trump administration, and that Democrats across the country had something of an edge they normally don't have in midterm elections where Republican turnout is usually quite a bit better. Beto decided to run a positive campaign against Cruz, and rather than focusing on Cruz's shortcomings, he tried to run as a cool guy who has some ideas. Um, basically, this wasn't a bad idea since Cruz was more or less a walking billboard against himself. Cruz tried to attack uh, Beto in negative ways, but most of those kind of backfired. Um, Cruz ran ads about Beto being uh, a punk rocker, and most people just thought, hey, that guy's actually pretty cool, and this Cruz guy's a total dork. 
Um, Beto used social media fairly well, just like some of his fellow 2018 candidates like AOC. There was a video of him skateboarding at a Whataburger that went viral. Now the video attracted some haters because Beto is not in fact Tony Hawk, but for a 40 something year old politician, he did pretty well. He also took a strong stand on NFL kneeling and police brutality. This really endeared him to the cultural left and ensured that he got even more online donations. On key issues, Beto's stances were somewhat less than clear. His environmental record is a bit mixed. And on Medicare for All, which is something that a lot of the progressive wing of the party was really harping on at this time, Beto waffled pretty hard. He was almost accepted by Justice Democrats since he didn't take PAC money, but his waffling on Medicare for All made the organization not endorse him at the last minute. He managed to raise millions and millions of dollars from 800,000 different individual donors, many of whom I'm sure are just people who hated Ted Cruz and lived out of the country, out of the uh, state, excuse me. Anyway, um, if you look at Beto's third quarter fundraising, he actually raised $38 million, which is an all-time record for a quarter's worth of fundraising for a Senate campaign. To put that in context, I was taking political science classes back around 2006 or 7, and I remember the professor telling us that the average Senate race at that time cost around $7 million for the winning candidate for the entire race. So if you have any doubts about the increasing power of money in politics and the proliferation of big money in politics, well, uh, just keep those numbers in mind. Take that for data. Beto ended up coming close, and he actually did outraise Cruz, despite Cruz getting an influx of money at the last minute and some visits from Donald Trump. Trump actually tried to make pretty with Cruz and even tried to change his nickname Lion Ted to Beautiful Ted. I don't know if any Republicans are still calling Ted Cruz Beautiful Ted, but now that he has a beard, maybe they are. Who knows? Anyway, Beto came within a point and a half but ultimately lost because he was a Democrat in Texas. And while Texas has been trending blue, it's not quite there yet. Had it been a general election year with that same momentum, Beto definitely could have won. Had he campaigned a little stronger on the issues and maybe hit Cruz in the ribs a little bit harder, maybe he could have won there too. But Cruz actually did some pretty smarmy shit during his campaign that I think is worthy of mentioning while we're on the topic. During one of the debates, uh, they were asked to say something positive about each other, and Beto praised Cruz as a family man. Cruz then responded, like the asshole that he is, by saying that he respected Beto for being such an open socialist, just like Bernie Sanders, or something to that effect. Um, anyway, I hate Ted Cruz, and I really wish that Beto had beaten him and just uh, gotten rid of him. Cruz is human garbage. I can't even pretend otherwise. The man is despicable. He is just trash, pure trash. A really common question that comes up anytime people are discussing the 2020 Democrats is why did Beto O'Rourke decide to run for president if he wasn't able to win a Senate seat? What about his defeat made him think that he needs to just aim for a higher office? Well, I think that the answer is surprisingly simple. Beto O'Rourke is a victim of bad punditry. So in most mainstream political science thinking, and especially in the thinking of the people who run campaigns and run the party, the number one determinant of someone's electability is their ability to raise money. Now, as I mentioned, Beto set fundraising records as a candidate for the Senate against Ted Cruz. Rather than seeing this as an indictment of just how terrible Ted Cruz is, which I think is the true reason why Beto was so successful at getting money, people have instead opined that Beto is the future, that Beto is a political dynamo, the future president of the United States. People were urging him to run right after it was announced that he had just lost. And by people, I mean mostly kind of centristy Democrats who write for Politico and other organizations where they accept the doctrine that the ability to raise money is an equal sign with one's political ability, period. 
So, therefore, there is the term the Beto effect, something that both Beto and his supporters have pushed. And this is the idea that Beto's popularity is responsible for carrying a few down-ballot Democrats to victory. That's an odd argument. Um, normally, only presidents have that kind of a pull. It's very rare for a Senate candidate who doesn't succeed to manage to pull that off. Beto also claims that he caused Beto mania in Texas and that he really had Texas Democrats fired up. Okay, they were fired up. They lost. Um, Beto mania is not Hulkamania. Beto and his supporters saw his run against Cruz as a warm-up. He has a proven ability to raise money, a fresh face, a national profile. He's a Spanish speaker. He's woke, at least on issues of NFL protocol. And he's a cool persona because he played punk rock and can ride a skateboard. There are also a lot of memes in support of Beto, most of which date from his run for the Senate. One that I enjoyed was a fake, poorly done Xbox One cover of Beto O'Rourke's Pro Skater, America is Ready for a 360. The joke here, of course, is that Microsoft's previous console is the Xbox 360, so this kind of works on a number of levels that I can appreciate as a gamer. Nonetheless, um, Beto should not be running, and he and his main backers have seriously overestimated his political appeal. There were very specific circumstances which made him so able to raise money against Ted Cruz. The main circumstance in play was Ted Cruz, who everyone hates. Beto's campaign officially launched in March of 2019. Announcement videos are something of an art form, by which I mean that you can phone it in and just show yourself in a suit talking into a camera about the general outline of your campaign. You could just hold a little rally of your supporters, have them cheer everything you say, or you could go full on creative like Mike Gravel in 2008, where he stared into the camera, then walked away and threw a rock into the water. Or you could do a hybrid approach like Beto O'Rourke. So while he's piling on the platitudes and doing the little hand jab thing, the announcement video has his wife staring at him with what can only be described as the look. Those of you who have taken a woman to orgasm know exactly what the look is. The look is the look that you get when you've done really well. And while he's talking about nothing, his wife is giving him the look, which I suppose is supposed to tell us that Beto can get the job done, that Beto can satisfy the needs of America, that Beto is a man's man. I don't know. I assume that was the thinking. I assume that Beto was trying to play on his relative youth and good looks and to uh, play up the sex appeal card. I don't think it had any impact, and I think that most people found it creepy. The people who watched the video all more or less had the same view that I had of this, that the implication was clear and it was kind of laughable and ridiculous. It's an odd debut, but Beto's campaign actually started out reasonably well, and this wasn't nearly as weird as, say, the revelation that John Hickenlooper and his mom once watched porn together. So, you know... No harm, no foul. Just one of those things where you're like, man, I see what you're trying to do here, and it's a little bit on the sleazy side. While Beto O'Rourke is not known for his substance, there actually is some substance to the Beto O'Rourke 2020 presidential campaign. So let's look at the parts of his platform that we could describe as pros, things that are stances which might actually appeal to voters. He has been in favor of ending criminalized marijuana for at least 10 years, and he now adds to that expunging the records of offenders. This is something where he has a consistent track record. He's been calling for this ever since he was a city councilor in El Paso, and this is something that is increasingly popular, especially in the Democratic Party, but also beyond the Democratic Party. He also claims that he wants to address the opioid crisis in rural America, although he has yet to furnish any details of how he plans to go about that. The fact that he's speaking about it at all is a good thing, since there are some in the Democratic Party who would consider that issue too white to address. Um, Beto 
is clearly trying to avoid playing excessive identity politics, and that's a good thing. He wants to impose term limits for House members, senators, and Supreme Court justices. For House members, he would allow them to serve six terms or 12 years. For the Senate, they would be allowed to serve two terms or 12 years. And for the Supreme Court, he would want them to only serve for 18 years. There are a few other candidates, I think Pete Buttigieg is among them, who have also endorsed something similar, at least when it comes to Supreme Court. Beto is in favor of living wages for teachers and universal pre-K. These aren't very radical ideas, and they're not all that exciting, but they are important, and dem uh, Democrats really love education. At least the voters do, maybe not the politicians. He wants to place some limits on the role of money in politics. He's against PACs, although, as I'll point out, uh, he is not completely reliable on the issue of money in politics, despite his official stance. The one thing that he has going for him that might make him stand out a little bit in terms of getting his issues onto someone else's platform is that he might actually have the best voting rights agenda of any candidate going into 2020. He wants there to be nationwide automatic and same-day voter registration. That, of course, would be very convenient and something that would really enable people to exercise their right more easily. He wants there to be a national election holiday. That also would be a great thing. Many people are unable to make it to the polls on the day of the election due to work obligations. This would ensure that they don't have that excuse. He also wants to really extend the time for early voting, keeping the polls open on the weekends for about two weeks before the election. Um, he wants to switch over to paper ballots and or improve cybersecurity for voting machines. That's something that could prevent any future allegations of fraud and also leave a paper trail that could be followed. It's not a perfect solution, but it is better than what we have now. He also wants to register in this way at least 50 million new voters. Right now, our voter participation rate is barely over half, so this would probably get it up to around 75 or 80%. Pretty bold, and I think that this is exactly the kind of policy that someone needs in order to stand out. This is something that he can really campaign on that's positive, that uh, sort of works with his high energy personality and avoiding controversy and negativity. And unlike most of the other things he talks about, this is something that would actually help the country and strengthen our democracy. While Beto O'Rourke might have a few good ideas here and there, there are also some shortcomings with his platform. What else can you expect from someone as spastic and superficial as Tube Man? Beto's climate change plan is underdeveloped and unclear. I read every word of it on his website and I have absolutely no idea what he intends to do about the climate. On LGBTQ equality and reproductive rights, Beto's stances are more or less boilerplate for the Democratic Party of today. That's fine, but I feel like he could actually take a little bit more credit than a lot of people when it comes to LGBTQ equality since he has been campaigning on that for his entire career, and he was a little bit ahead of the curb. Um, he went that direction before, say, Hillary Clinton or Obama or a lot of other prominent Democrats in the past. So I feel like this is something that he could point out that would work to his favor. Here's where things fall apart officially, though. Beto O'Rourke has no economic policy. There's no mention of wages, outsourcing, working conditions, technology, job training, college, nothing that we really need to talk about. And if you're a Democrat and you don't run with an economic message, you're pretty much dead on arrival. So that's something that Beto will have to fix if he wants to ever be taken seriously at a national level. If you ain't talking money, you're talking don't matter, as Vince McMahon's theme song said. He also is very prone to use unnecessary and verbose platitudes. He often likes to talk about the genius of our democracy and says that the genius of our democracy is that we can discuss different ways to get to different policies 
or different outcomes. That is not really a genius feature. That's just an obvious feature. And we end up mostly discussing the same things for decade after decade. We've been debating healthcare for over a hundred years. The genius of our democracy needs to break out of analysis paralysis. Um, even when he has substance, it's bogged down by prolix rhetoric. It's really hard to figure out what the fuck Beto is talking about at times. Another great example of Beto really being off the mark is his policy of Medicare for America. This is basically the public option, but he changed the verbiage to make it different. He thinks that Medicare for America sounds more appealing than Medicare for all. So far, no one is clamoring for Medicare for America. So despite having an English degree from an Ivy League school and using way too many words every time he opens his mouth, Beto can't seem to find the right words. And his Medicare for America thing comes off as really being a sham, as more or less a distraction and something that is not going to take off and which will not solve America's health care problems. It appears that the surfeit of words that Beto O'Rourke uses do not help clarify his messaging, but rather make it more unclear. Beto's stated position is that he is for greatly enhanced transparency, including limiting PAC contributions. However, his early fundraising in the presidential campaign, which we'll get to, hints very strongly that he must have engaged in big money bundling. While he claims that he's against PACs, there's also a lot of evidence that he has been taking money from the oil and gas industries. He calls himself a progressive at times, but Beto's lefty credentials are virtually non-existent. When he first got in the government in El Paso, he and two of his friends called themselves the progressives. But again, what has he done which would count as, a prog as progressive outside of Texas? I mean, sure, I guess his marijuana legalization policy is fairly progressive. Some of what he said about money and politics is progressive. Maybe even his um, voting rights stances could be labeled progressive. But for the most part, when you look at what makes a progressive in 2019, those things are not really Beto O'Rourke. He's not clearly in favor of Medicare for all. He's not in favor of getting all money out of politics. And oh yeah, did I mention that he has no economic message? because he has no economic message. Beto's difficult to label though. I don't know exactly where he lies on the ideological spectrum. Partly that's because he doesn't have a fully fleshed out platform or ideology. He's been pegged as a progressive, liberal, centrist, and a neoliberal at various points in his career. I would say that he is somewhere between a liberal and a centrist but given his ties with oil and gas, it is possible that he is neoliberal. That being said, because most of his fundraising over the years has come from individual donors, especially in his Senate campaign, I am not super comfortable labeling him as a neoliberal at this juncture. To circle back to Beto's actual campaign, which began in March, it had something of a strange start, and by strange I mean suspicious. On day one of his fundraising, Beto managed to break Bernie Sanders' fundraising record by pulling in $6.1 million in the first 24 hours. That's odd since after two hours of this campaign's launch, he had only raised a pittance. So apparently a lot of the people who planned on giving money to Beto didn't hear that Beto was running until the last minute. What this suggests heavily is that there were people, big money bundlers, who decided to back Beto because they didn't like Bernie, and they had to make sure that Beto outraised Bernie to show that Beto had the momentum. The only plausible way for Beto O'Rourke to reach those kind of numbers is through big money bundling. He was also not very forthcoming about how he pulled this off when asked about it back in March. Beto has ties with Texas-based oil and gas companies. So this did create a little bit of momentum and buzz when Beto raised all this money. And a lot of the online pundits who had talked about how Beto was such a great candidate said, see, we're right, Beto will manage to take the country by storm. He's got a lot of supporters. 
he really has a lot of buzz about him. People will really rally to his banner. Yet, that initial momentum was probably due to name recognition, and Beto doesn't really have a lot of substance, so this initial momentum quickly started to crumble after just a couple of weeks, and Beto's numbers have been steadily declining. In one of the more recent polls, he was actually tied with Andrew Yang, who is a very obscure candidate who is just struggling to get name recognition right now. Andrew Yang, of course, has a much better campaign, and he has been trending in the right direction, but um, the fact that O'Rourke, who had such media exposure less than a year ago when he was running against Ted Cruz, is only at the same level as Andrew Yang, speaks volumes about the quality of O'Rourke's candidacy. I never really thought that Beto was a top-tier candidate, but there for a minute, I was reconsidering my position. Then, around a week or so into Beto's campaign, he released a video that let me know that my initial analysis that he was a second-tier candidate at best was correct. Early on, Beto put out a video where he is pumping gas in Iowa, and he recommends that the amount that he spent to fill his tank should be the new standard donation amount, 2853. What he's trying to do clearly is to create his own artificial version of Bernie's average donation of $27. Bernie got that amount just by looking at the numbers people were donating and averaging it out. And then he is really into precise statistics, something that is one of Bernie's traits. So he talks about very precise numbers all the time. And he just kept saying $27 all the time until it kind of caught on and people found it vaguely charming to donate $27 to Bernie Sanders. This shows that Beto's understanding of even social media, where he's usually credited as being pretty savvy, has its limits. And I would argue also that his understanding of politics and the way that memes start really has its limits. Maybe he really wasn't born to be in it after all. In El Paso, Beto O'Rourke had been a very effective campaigner by going door to door. When he was running for the Senate, he did a somewhat similar tactic, going all around Texas and visiting every single county. On the national stage, he thought that he would simply do the same thing and run a similar grassroots and personal appearance based campaign. But it hasn't been working for him. From March to May, he was doing this, working very hard and just watching his supporter road. In May, Beto decided to stop the bleeding, and he decided to shift tax. He hired some Obama campaign veterans and shifted his focus to building campaign infrastructure, especially in Iowa, where he now has 12 full-time staffers. In New Hampshire, he also has a campaign, but no one full-time, at least as of the last report that I read back in May. So far, Beto has no tangible results from this shift in strategy. My suspicion is that the Obama team really just doesn't have any actual ideas for him aside from really focusing heavily on Iowa and trying to use the momentum from Iowa to then move forward into the other states. They probably think that Obama's victory in Iowa in 2008 was ultimately decisive. It helped a lot, but it definitely wasn't decisive. If Beto really wants to be successful, he'll have to compete in all the states. And I think that the impact of Iowa on the way that people vote in other states has been vastly exaggerated over the years, and that the sort of traditionalist thinking about politics will not serve Beto well. Put simply, Beto O'Rourke is guilty of committing strategic errors of an egregious nature. Beto is running as the white Obama in a field where Booker, Buttigieg, Castro, and Harris are all running as variations on Obama, and where Joe Biden is running as Obama's Robin turned Nightwing. This is something that everyone else has already thought of, and as the white version of Obama, Beto is frankly the least interesting variation. This just isn't going to work. The combination of a lack of experience and policy expertise means that Beto's platform is weak and incomplete. So if we look at some of the other candidates, we can kind of peg where they are. For instance, 
Yang is known as the UBI guy. Tulsi is known as the foreign policy person. Even though they're at about the same level as Beto right now in terms of their success, they at least have a reputation for some kind of expertise. There's something that you can look at with them and then think that you can trust them with this issue. So if there were happened to be a major foreign policy crisis, this might actually help Tulsi. Who actually thinks that Beto's an expert in anything? There's not going to be a punk rock crisis. Beto leans way too heavily on his own charisma. And while he does have more charisma than most of the other candidates in the field, especially some of the more boring people like Julian Castro and Kirsten Gillibrand, charisma by itself doesn't really do anything. Charisma is only effective when it's applied to situations where it can really work. So, for instance, if we look at charismatic politicians like, say, JFK, JFK had a lot of charisma, but it was coupled with a fairly aggressive, exciting, and forward-looking viewpoint and platform. And that really allowed his charisma to sing. If you're just charismatic and avoid, you come off as spastic and superficial, maybe even a little bit weird. Beto is just simply not presidential timber. I don't think he ever will be. And he shouldn't be running. That's the real mistake. He should not be running for president. He is perfectly fine for other offices, but this guy is not ready for prime time. He does not belong in the major leagues. Not to belabor that point too much about Beto not being presidential temper, but I really can't envision him defeating Trump in a presidential campaign. Let's say that he makes it to the nomination. Beto is not able to deliver punches, and if you're fighting someone like Trump in a political battle, you have to be able to deal with a bully. Beto is not that guy. He doesn't have it. The GOP also has shown that it is willing and able to hammer Beto with a stream of memes. Some of these memes are completely made up, by the way. The one about how Beto supposedly said that he would throw out the elderly and wounded veterans with the garbage, that's completely made up. And PolitiFact put out a pants on fire warning for it, yet it got shared many times on social media. The Trump crowd would eat Beto alive. Beto's odd mannerisms and sort of pseudo woke stuff would definitely inspire them to really support Pepe for a second term. In the meantime, Beto has no economic message. And if we know anything about Democratic campaigns, is that if you run without an economic message, you do not win. So there's no way that Beto would be competitive in the Midwest unless there was a complete economic collapse or a major war where Trump got a lot of American soldiers killed. I mean, it would require incredible luck for Beto to defeat Trump. Republicans have attacked him on all kinds of stuff, and some of it seems to have stuck to some degree. They said of his period of contemplation for running for president that it smacked of straight white male privilege. That's just straight up trolling. But it's kind of funny because they know that Beto will respond. They know that Beto will become flustered and uncomfortable with the idea that he has straight white male privilege and that he'll then stumble over himself to try to prove that he doesn't or that he's woke or whatever. Now, a lot of these memes will fail terribly, just like uh, the memes that Cruz ran about Beto being a punk rocker but if they actually land something that resonates with voters, Beto's charisma is not such that it provides the kind of Teflon coating that allows things to bounce off. Beto can't take a political punch the way that some candidates can. And for that reason, I don't think that he would even be able to beat Trump. So if he is um, nominated somehow, then that would be a disaster for the Democratic Party. No one loves cliches more than our good friend Beto, so I have one for him. If you shoot for the stars and miss, at least you might land on the moon. I might have fucked that up, but you all know exactly what I'm talking about. Beto should just run for the Senate again. He is not presidential timber. He can't win. Just let, run for the Senate again. You almost did it last time, and this time you'll be up against a weaker opponent. As early as November 9, 2018, a Washington Post editorial 
called for Beto to not run for president, but instead run for the Senate again. And I think increasingly everyone is aware that this is the better course for him, as it becomes clear that he is viable in Texas, but not on the national democratic stage. Both pundits and people leaving comments on YouTube are beginning to figure out that Beto could beat John Cornyn in 2020, even if his chances of ever becoming the Democratic nominee for president are basically non-existent. Cornyn is less high profile than Cruz. Texas is slowly becoming more competitive, and general elections tend to be kinder to Democrats than midterms. So if Beto had a moment where he was born to be in it, it's 2020 and the Senate race in Texas. So while I think that Beto should have just stuck with punk rock and cultural stuff, he chose to go into politics. And now that he's made that choice, I believe that this is the best course of action. In the Senate, he could do a little bit of good, and he could also finally succeed where his father never did. He could hold a really high-profile national office. Maybe from the Senate, he can help to influence whoever the next president is to make policies that are better than the ones that Cruz made. Or, hell, let's be honest, he'll just vote for a few things that are good and then screw the Democrats on a few things. But at least he won't be John Cornyn or Ted Cruz. And that's the best we can hope for from the tube man.